Welcome to What I've Learned, the podcast which talks to child protection practitioners in development and humanitarian settings about community-led approaches. If you're a practitioner who's trying to find ways to strengthen community ownership of child protection, or perhaps you're just interested in learning more, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Lucy Hillier. I'm a child protection advisor living in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I focus on participatory and community-led approaches for child protection. As part of this, I run an initiative called the Community Child Protection Exchange, which develops innovative ways to help practitioners build their skills as facilitators of a community-led approach. Each episode, I talk with an expert from the child protection world, and we hear about their unique experience of community-led child protection and what they've learned along the way. We talk to academics and researchers, program advisors and field staff from all over the globe and discuss real life examples of how different communities have led their own child protection. In this special episode, I'm in conversation with Ken Honduro and Juan Jose Castellanes Petraita. They join me as guests for a live event to celebrate the end of a four-week learning journey by nearly 40 War Child Holland child protection practitioners. I'll be asking our guests some of the questions which were sent in by the practitioners. We pack a lot in and talk about everything from safeguarding to parenting, and we also talk about how facilitating a community-led child protection response is not just about a community changing, it's also about how we as practitioners need to reflect on and make changes to the way we do our own work. Community-led doesn't mean leave community alone. It just means give the community space, give them the power, let's work together, let's partner, let's link up one goal, you know, protecting our children. They, they, they think that people now see them as people who care about the children and who do actions uh, to care about the children and to protect children in, in those communities. I'm really excited that we've got two real live guests who are going to answer a lot of questions around community-led approaches. Um, And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about each person before we start. So Ken, this is Ken Onduro. Um, Ken is a really experienced community-led child protection facilitator from Kenya. Uh, He's got a track record of implementing a lot of successful child protection interventions in diverse communities across Africa. And he has a deep passion for safeguarding the rights and well-being of children And he's dedicated pretty much his whole career to championing community-led approaches. And this works by empowering communities to take leadership and ownership of child protection initiatives. So welcome, Ken. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Okay. And our second guest um, is Juan Jose Castellanos Pedraita. He has a psychology degree from Universidad de los Andes and is currently studying for his master's in interdisciplinary studies of development and writing a dissertation on community care. Juan Jose has a previous background in working in child protection as the country's program in the country programs and as uh, the program manager in, in the humanitarian sector. And since 2020, he's really focused on community led child protection. Um, yeah, currently he's the program manager for Colombia's country office, and I'm really excited to have both of you here. So welcome, Juan Jose. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Nice, nice to be here. Thanks for joining. It's really been great uh, to have both of you here because you've got a lot of learning, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge that you're going to share with us. I think when we talk about these child led approaches, sometimes it feels like something that can't be done or that's just a dream or something that we would like to do, but that's very hard. So I'm hoping today we can unpack how you've addressed working in a community led way in your own respective context. And it brings it up to life and makes us see that it is possible, maybe not easy, but it is possible. So I wanted to just start uh, with Ken to just give us a little bit of an update on uh, where you are in your own journey. How did you get to this community-led place where a lot of the work you do is now community-led child protection? 
Um, just give us a little brief update of, uh, yeah, what you've been doing, what led to this. So it has been a long journey. It's been uh, uh, 14 years, you know, specifically working on community led work. But this idea of community led <clears throat> work was birthed by so many things. So I'm a development consultant, and so I did so many baselines and evaluations for different projects, uh, especially uh, child protection projects. And I could see the gaps. I could clearly see uh, the shortcomings of the top-down approaches. I could clearly see the shortcomings of very controversial uh, child rights projects. I'm putting that in quotes. I could see the gaps, you know. I could see large amounts of resources, both financial and human, being spent in addressing uh, child protection concerns. And then upon the withdrawal of the organizations, the projects die off. Communities left with, uh, with nothing. I could see projects not aligned to communities, priorities, culture, tradition, needs, you know. I could identify uh, all that. And so I became curious to just try to understand whether there's any other way of doing uh, this uh, project, any other way of addressing issues affecting the community uh, that would then be more sustainable, would respect the community, would respect their culture, and would encourage genuine participation, not participation like we've always done it. And then in that process, I met uh, Mike Wessels and uh, another person called Kathleen Costelli, <laughs> who were also conducting a study in, 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 in Kenya. And by then, it was just, uh, uh, I think there was funding for ethnographic study on community-led child protection systems. And so I was part of that. And then that also ignited my thirst towards understanding the community, understanding community systems, understanding what works, what doesn't work, linkages with the formal uh, you know, systems, and how that plays out. So with that really informed my interest in community-led. So to make it short, it was informed by uh, my experience as evaluation and baseline and research consultant. And so I could identify those gaps as well as participating in uh, an ethnographic study on community-led child protection, community-based child protection system. Thanks, Ken. It's really fascinating. Um, I see that it, a lot of what you've said is you felt there were shortcomings in the way that we were currently working. But I, I also found it interesting that you said, I'm doing this with my fingers, controversial child rights. Um, the fact that the idea that child rights are controversial, there's a lot of people listening maybe who, who might think, well, no, child rights are your rights. They're automatic. What's controversial about that? So just in like one or two sentences, could you just say, why do you call them controversial, these child rights? Yeah, so what I meant is from the perspective of the community. And so I will share this later on, on how communities, especially and specifically in those communities I've worked with perceive child rights interventions or projects. And uh, my experience, both being on the research and uh, the evaluation side, is that there's nothing wrong with child rights projects. But sometimes the communication and, and implementation of child rights projects end up causing more harm to the child as opposed to protecting the child. Great. Yeah. And like you say, we'll, we'll look at that in more detail as we go along today in this um, live event. 
So maybe Juan Jose, would you also like to just give us a little bit of a background about yourself? What's your journey of getting to this community led type work? Um, where did it start and what was really important to you? So um, some self reflection aspects, some academic aspects and, and some organizational aspects as well. Um, since I, I graduated from psychology, I have been working in child protection. I have been working for um, the formal child protection system as well, which is not uh, too community-led um, per se. Um, and also in child protection programs for national NGOs, which are pretty much connected to community work and uh, work oriented towards social change. Um, I think it was in 2020 when I had started having conversations around uh, community-led child protection with Greenskin, uh, who is in an R&D department. Um, and I started making a lot of links um, on, on how this, uh, this approach um, was actually linking to many of our Global South thinking, which includes, of course, participatory action research, popular education, which were passions of mine uh, before starting those, those discussions. Um, and started making those links uh, towards those discussions and towards, of course, uh, pilot implementation of our methodology that many of you uh, know, which is SEEDS. Uh, then, yeah, I went through, through a journey of uh, self-reflection, but also reflection with the communities and with the community coaches of, uh, of our SEEDS implementation on, on, on how these approaches were actually more participative, more sustainable, uh, and that could actually uh, achieve that the community continued to do work after we we left, which I think was one of the issues that can uh, mention it. Uh, more on a, on a personal side, I started uh, learning also about alternatives to uh, hegemonic theories of development. So I, I also saw linkages there and, and I think everything started uh, connecting um, and working also with indigenous communities, seeing how they could really um, gather around and make changes and, and actually how little they needed of us uh, and uh, how much they could achieve by themselves and empower themselves. Um, so I think I think that's uh, briefly my, my summary of it. Um, and I, I, I do really believe strongly in community work and I really, really believe that through community work we can achieve uh, social change and it needs to be led by the communities, not by us. Thanks, Juan Jose. Yeah, I think we'll get into more into what you're doing um, as we go along. Um, but one thing I think is intriguing for a lot of people is the way you've been doing your work. You mentioned indigenous communities, um, and probably a lot of people are aware of some of the indigenous communities in South America. So it's interesting for us to hear about that. I thought it was interesting also what you said about how little they needed us. <laughs> so in a way, are we editing ourselves out of the whole story because community-led relies less and less on NGOs and on uh, these people like us, I guess? That's maybe a question we can talk about a bit later. But thank you for telling us, both of you, your, your stories. Um, my suggestion is that we sort of go into the questions. The way we'll do it is I'll just sort of ask Ken maybe to answer now the first question and then uh, Juan Jose... Um, I'll ask you the same question and you, you can answer. This one I think is nice because it's something that someone asked, but it's also um, a really good way of introducing the context of where you've actually been working um, so that we can learn a little bit about some of one of or some of the programs that you've been involved in. I think a lot of people maybe are more familiar with Ken, although we don't know a lot because we've watched the videos, so we know where the project is. We don't know much about Juan Jose's work yet. So um, I'm going to ask Ken the first this question, and then I'll, I'll come on to you, Juan Jose. So someone asked, can you give us an inspirational example of what a community approach, a community-led approach, can lead to? So it's an inspirational example of what a community-led approach can lead to. Um, Ken, would you be prepared to answer that and maybe just give us a little bit of background um, of an example that you know well? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Lucy, for, for that question. So for the last 10 years, I think I've been implementing a community-led uh, project. 
in two areas. So let me just give you the recent, uh, the recent uh, outcome of one of the, the, the in, in one of the areas where the implementation is still going on. Uh, it's called Bamba. It's still in Kilifi County, one of the counties here in Kenya. So this community, uh, I'm giving an, a, a new example because I think you've watched uh, the videos uh, from Marafa, so you, you're very familiar with what goes on there. So in this new context, uh, uh, actually, uh, the communities wanted to address the issue of early pregnancy. In the other, in the other context, they were addressing issues of early sexual debut. So uh, here, in this new village, the communities realized that the issue of sanitary towels was a major issue that was pushing girls into transactional sex and then that leading into early pregnancies. And so they discussed among, amongst themselves. Uh, I've always been part of the meetings. And they wanted to find a solution to, uh, to the issue of sanitary towels. And so they first discussed about how to raise funds to buy sanitary towels. But the challenge to that is that we work in an extremely poor communities, and so there were no funds. And in this community, by the way, there's only one NGO working there. So they are not exposed to even uh, the NGOs to approach to, to support them. There's only one government office, so the government is not an option. And so one of them who had traveled to the town center, Kilifi, heard of people talking about reusable sanitary towels. I know there are NGOs who have tried to implement projects on reusable sanitary towels. And so when she came back to the community and we were having community meetings, she raised the issue and it was a point of discussion for about a month. And then they requested me if I can find someone to support them, uh, train the women in making reusable sanitary towels as opposed to making those reusable sanitary towels and supplying them in the community. To cut the long story short, I got someone from Kilifi. In fact, one of the community members who had Part of that meeting is the one who guided me. I managed to trace an organization uh, that is uh, uh, doing that, training. Uh, they're not actually training women, but they are making these reusable sanitary towels and selling them uh, for about $1 in Kilifi. So we had a discussion with them. I took them to the community, and they started training women on reusable sanitary towels. So instead of using a sewing machine, they train them on how to use the needles. They train them on how to use uh, pieces of materials that they already have, old clothes and, and all that. So it is not perfect. It doesn't meet the standard. But at least uh, women and girls in that context have something uh, to use. And as we speak now, in the two villages where uh, the intervention is being implemented, girls have access to sanitary towels, and even the neighboring villages, because our scope is quite small. Huh? It's quite small. We just focus on one village. The neighboring villages now have access to reusable sanitary towels. And uh, the women who are trained have trained other women and other men. I can share with you the videos and, and, and pictures. You see how men <laughs> are also making reusable sanitary towels girls in those villages have been trained. And uh, for me, I just watch them do, you know. So that's one of the success stories that, that I can talk about. Our government policy is to provide free sanitary towels in schools. And just like any other government led by politicians, the policy is quite clear the implementation is zero. So the community have been able to address that gap. 
So I think that's one of the examples uh, I can share. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. And you know, um, just to add, because I happen to know a little bit about that, is um, something people might want to be interested to hear is that um, Bamba, my understanding is that when the original uh, action research was taking place in uh, Marafa, uh, Bamba was considered the comparison community. So in order to see what difference there would be between a community where certain work was being undertaken and um, a community where there wasn't this work, um, Bamba was originally the, the comparison community. Um, so you were able to measure the difference at that time. It was, you said it was um, early sexual debut and, and, and early pregnancies. And so you could count the difference between the two communities. But also what was interesting was once Bamba started to hear from other people living in Marafa that they uh, were doing this uh, action research and that it was working really well and the girls weren't all getting pregnant as frequently, um, the people in Bamba sort of requested that um, some some work be done in their own community they wanted to kind of replicate and it was a kind of word of mouth but they were keen to do it and they asked you to come and work with them is that right yes that's right lucy so some people ask yeah. you know can you scale replicate these kinds of things and that's an example of how it's sort of spread by word of mouth because it's successful and people want to do it and they didn't necessarily think they were going to get resources or money or jobs from it but they saw the good results and that seemed to be the inspiration for wanting to do it, which I think maybe is an important aspect of something that's community owned and led is they see the benefit, but then their motivation is not money or jobs necessarily. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that even in, in the first site where we, we, we started from, we already have other 20 villages more or less doing the same, same thing. I was there recently. I rarely go, go back there. But it is that motivation from the two villages and and what uh, what they are doing that have influenced the other uh, twenty villages. So they are they are trying to copy, but copying in their own way, you know. Yeah. So it's it's that kind of motivation, word of mouth. They share the same market, and so they talk about it. Uh, they they discuss about it. But uh, we are also facing some uh, challenges because now. Uh, we have NGOs that are interested in coming and working in those areas, and they want to come with, the, you know, the, the 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 projects as we are used to implementing them. So it, we are also trying to reach out to the other stakeholders, uh, government, uh, and all that. If the process can just be supported and not diluted. Uh, by by you know coming back again with the top down uh, model. Yeah, that's a, that's a really um, good point. I hadn't personally, I hadn't thought about that a lot, but it's true. You know, you you could be working like you've just described. There's a lot of small villages or communities that have got excited and heard about what's been happening nearby. They've done their own version. It's very community driven. And then you still have, in a way, a sort of almost an interference by NGOs coming along now wanting to implement um, and kind of almost sometimes maybe undermining what they were already doing. And I hadn't really thought about the aspect of when a community does something for itself and then later on other NGOs come. So are you hoping to uh, sort of influence these new NGOs that they can sort of work with the community in a way that is more community-led, as opposed to just coming in with a new idea and replacing the community-driven version? Yes, we are trying to do that, but it is more sustainable to influence the community than the NGOs. The NGOs are very difficult to influence. It takes a longer time. So once the community understands that they have the power, they can do certain things, they can even decide to use the NGOs as opposed to the NGOs using them in quotes. Huh? Yeah. So it's, it's easy to influence, support, encourage uh, the community as opposed to the formal system. Lucy, we've tried in the formal system. It is very, very, very slow. And sometimes people come with huge funding and you can't tell them uh, anything, you know. 
So it's a slow process in the formal system, no, uh, not, not, not because people are bad in the formal system, but I think it's how the formal system has been structured for a very long time. Changing that then, you know, we'll have to take longer time than the time it took to establish uh, the system the way it is. Yeah, that really gives a new understanding to the concept of empowerment, doesn't it? When it's the communities learn to use the NGOs in the way that they need to do what they want to do. Thanks, Ken, for that. We're going to move on um, to Juan Jose. Juan Jose, it's basically the same question for you, but obviously you're going to tell us about something very different. Um, so can you just ex sort of talk around an inspirational example of what a community-led approach can lead to in the context that you have worked in? Sure, Lucy. Um... Yeah, I think I think I had three examples to share, but I will focus on one, um, and all very inspirational for for many different reasons. So I will, I have we have experience in urban contexts, we have experience in indigenous remote areas, and we also have experience uh, implementing community led uh, child protection approaches in in communities which are migrant and also indigenous in the same at the same time, which is uh, makes it very interesting. But I will focus in the Pacific of Colombia, which is, um, yeah, it is, a, it is a very complicated area, very heavily affected by armed conflict. Um, it, we did uh, implement seeds in two communities there, which are two different indigenous uh, communities, which speak different languages, um, and which are very different from themselves. So one is located to one of these uh, very difficult neighborhoods of the um, yeah, the capital municipality of, of, of Chocó, which is a department in the Pacific. Um, it's very close. It's a community that has been displaced uh, in the 90s and, and that settled down there and tried to reestablish the community. Um, yeah, work use and way of, of, of doing the work. And one which is located in, um, in a, a, like an hour away, close to a river, which was also uh, a displaced community by the armed conflict. Uh, so these are communities that have been affected by the armed conflict and that are constantly affected all the time by armed conflict uh, still. Uh, and this is specific one in the in the municipality of of, Cho of Kipdo, which is the capital of Chocom, uh, which is affected by violence in urban context as well. Uh, so we we did uh, yeah we th this is the first time we were implementing um, a community led approach. Uh, in indigenous communities, and 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 we tried, uh, we we really uh, thought about it a lot, and 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 figure out by ourselves that we had many prejudices, prejudices actually as as an organization and as persons. Even though we uh, have worked with indigenous communities in the past, and even though we um, have learned and read together with them uh, through a lot of processes before. Um, so basically, what uh, what is interesting about this community is that uh, we went through a whole learning together with the community process. There's a community coach who was part of this community, uh, so he's an indigenous person um, who is a young leader from that community um, and 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 was very eager to learn about this this process and this approach. Uh, we went, we had community facilitators who were very diverse. So we had community facilitators, uh, which are, are, yeah, the people who volunteer to do community work and to let the community led process uh, together with the community. Uh, one which was an indigenous guard, one which was a teacher in that community, uh, one which was an elder woman, uh, and one was also um, a male from the community. So it was a very diverse group uh, and, and interesting. Uh, they went through the through the learning phase, uh, and they were very um, actually they were very hesitant about this approach at sometimes because we weren't moving forward too fast or they weren't getting anything uh, uh, from it. And, and and of course they have received previously humanitarian aid or um, for being in a community that was displaced or were receiving humanitarian aid for a crisis that that was reported by OCHA in, I think it was 2019. Um, so basically what this, this community found out, and, and we were going through that process, we were learning also reflecting together with these community facilitators and the community coach, uh, that community found out that they there were many risks associated to children uh, going to the bathroom close to the river. So they, they did, this community doesn't use um, 
occidental washrooms. Uh, so they, they, they went by themselves to the river. They had many harms also going to the school because there was a, a part where they had to close a small, not a river, but a small, a small flow of water. Um, and also they identified that they had risk associated to the neighborhood that was just next to them. And, and those were mostly related to um, them just leaving the children uh, going by themselves to, to many places. Um, we went through the process uh, and actually the learning phase took more time than we expected. And this is also something that I think I want to, to reflect on that sometimes um, the NGO plans or, for example, war child plans on, on implementation might not uh, be completely followed when you're following a, a community-led approach and you also need to, uh, to adapt to the terms of, of the community and to the ways that they are working. Um, so they made many, many reflection exercises. They uh, went through walks with the community. They went through community discussions. Um, and then they actually they, they just made a click uh, that they had, a, they had their own mechanisms to, to address this. Uh, so actually this is the indigenous guard and I, I want to make an introduction on indigenous guards, which are non-violent, non-military guards that basically take care of the community and defend the community from armed actors or any, um, yeah, any harm that could possibly uh, the community have, but without using any violence or without using a military approach. Uh, so they found out that this, this, this indigenous guard was actually equipped to do these kind of things, but they just, uh, they, they reflected this by themselves in their monthly community meetings. Uh, and they organized a system where the indigenous guard could bring these issues every time in a monthly meeting, uh, which they usually are used to have uh, in this, this community. Uh, also, I think an, an interesting uh, thing that happened is that uh, well, also as, as, as part of the action plan that they developed in this community, they, they actually made some bridges and they organized a system to take care and to watch children when they were going to, to the bathroom by themselves or where they were going to schools or when they were just playing around because there were dangers from the neighborhood um, close to them. But an interesting thing is that actually when they started and, and, and kick off and, and started reflecting by themselves and within the community, uh, they thought of many things that were actually causing harms to children and that they wouldn't be able to, to address probably by, by, by the, the timeline that we were working in SITS. And actually they found out that there was a, a, a roof in a, in, a, in, a, in a school, a small school that there's in this, in this place. And they, they were asking us, oh, can we do this? And we were like, yeah, this is your, your, your decision. It is really not... Uh, not not ours, and and we didn't went for two weeks, and then they just fixed the the roof uh, by themselves, uh, and and shared the results also in those community meetings, which was very, uh, I think, very inspiring, and it got got us to the point that uh, we they really think, and there's really a power relationship between communities and 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 us as as NGO and especially as NGO actors. Uh, and for example, when they were asking us if we can do this through the process, we uh, really had to make some key questions and powerful questions for them to reflect that this was their process and it wasn't uh, ours uh, to decide if they could do this or, or if it was a child protection issue that they were solving. Uh, but if they thought it, it was, it really, it really was. So, so actually, yeah, that's, that's my story. <laughs> that's, that's, thank you. That's a really great story too. So different, but I can see some similarities. It's interesting, isn't it, how uh, when something goes well, when the when a community or a group of people feel that something is really working for them, it's really addressing something that's important to them, um, that it sort of creates new versions, either like in Ken's example in neighboring villages or even within the same community, they start to think of lots of other projects that they could potentially do that help children like you said so my understanding was um the kids are there's very bad sanitation there and actually the children are getting into having accidents you know they're going and playing far away i think in a, you said actually maybe in a previous conversation we had that maybe they they play on kind of rubbish dumps so they those children are actually get having harm done to them just by their environment um and that the community once they 
saw that their system was working, they thought of all these other ways to uh, make children's environments safer. And something that's very interesting to me that you said to me about this project, um, and we had this discussion earlier, actually, in something else I was talking about, where we talk about parenting programs. And I said, well, I'm not a big fan of parenting programs because I find them to be very top down. But in your project, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about this idea that the parents and the adults reflected on how they uh, looked after and maybe um, supervised their own children and decided that they wanted to make some changes. Um, and I found that really interesting because they changed their parenting almost because of how they reflected, not because somebody came along with a parenting program. Um, maybe you can just elaborate a little bit on that. I think, yeah, actually, that's that's a, a very interesting aspect of, of this SIDS implementation. Because when they were doing the the, phase, the learning phase with the community and reflecting by themselves, they 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 actually reflect reflect about the the way they they see the world and their indigenous worldview, which um, actually uh, lets children be a little bit more free. But they reflected that they were now in a new environment since they were displaced, displaced, and it is it and there's dangers around that it is not the same environment that they. Um, where they used to live when they were, uh, for example, when the, when the parents were young children. So they they actually made this this click, uh, and this happened by themselves. Just the community facilitators uh, asking questions, uh, as doing for problem trees, or as doing uh, transit walks, or or focus group, or just open discussions with the community, uh, and they they thought that. This is a new environment, or this is a different environment, even though they have been there for a, for a while. Uh, but it is a, a different environment from the one that they're 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 used to, and their worldview um, made sense with. So they actually said, "Okay, we need to really uh, watch a little bit more on our children, especially due to harms that are around, um, because we had we had been displaced. There's an affectation by the armed conflict, so it's." Uh, it was a very nice reflection, and and they actually started um, organizing themselves to watch children, which uh, uh, was very satisfying to see uh, when we uh, were leaving that community or when we went back to the community. So interesting. Um, just goes to show that in those communities in both Kenya and Colombia, where the space is given for communities to reflect deeply on what is the cause of certain harms to their children and harms which they prioritize. They come up with really innovative um, ideas, but they're also very motivated to do so. And I think that's a big part of having, you know, we often talk about that mindset. You need to work in a community led way of going in uh, with a positive attitude um, and trusting that the community do want to see their children well and kept safe um, and that the, the community already has lots of very able, either it's somebody who happened to find out that you can make um, just uh, reusable sanitary towels or that there's an existing structure to protect um, community members and indigenous guard who can also be mobilized to extend their protection to children I found the. I think maybe we'll have to post something about Indigenous Guard um, for people to read later. But um, I found it interesting because it seems to be youth-led this Indigenous Guard. But I think maybe it's a good point to just sort of move on um, and maybe ask you another question. And this comes up well in the context of what we've just I've just said. Um, and a lot of people ask this. Somebody asked a question about how does safeguarding work in a community-led way? And I think we're all very familiar with having safeguarding kind of operating standard operating procedures where you know certain people must be referred and it must go through this hierarchy and you must and how does this work if your community is leading the action um and is it just an anything goes where we we don't act on uh serious issues where we see children um you know who are in some kind of harm is happening to them how did it work in Kenya? I think I'll ask Ken first, and then we'll come to you, Juan Jose, and see how it worked in Colombia. So, Ken, yeah, what was the safeguarding setup in the programs you worked with? Let me start from this point, that uh, most people 
when you talk about community-led, they think that it means let community do it by themselves. Community-led is not about let the community try and find a solution by themselves or leave the community alone. It is about partnership, it's about collaboration, it's about linkages, it's about treating communities with respect and seeing them just as any human being. Uh, for us, even in our household, we can't do it alone, you know. We need support. You either have a partner, you have a brother, you have a job that provides you with uh, an income. So with community-led, it, it doesn't also mean leave community alone. It's about how do we partner with communities in a way that no one dominates the other. No one has more power over the other. But it's a partnership that benefits all the partners that are, in, that are involved. So in terms of uh, uh, safeguarding, uh, the communities themselves are aware of the issues that affect children in that context. And they know that there are issues that they can't handle. There are issues that there are other systems in place that should handle. So for example, you will not find a case of sexual abuse and exploitation. Yes, the communities try to hide them, but in the areas where, where, where we work in, I have seen the communities reporting to the nearest police station and going to the streets to, uh, to demonstrate. But now what we did with regards to, to safeguarding is that myself as a facilitator, I took the community through the process of safeguarding. And I told them, if, because sometimes you can go in as a community-led facilitator and then you end up exploiting people in the community. So how is the community even protected uh, from you yourself? You know, that has to be put into consideration. And how do you do that? By just empowering the communities to know that these are the boundaries that exist. As a person, as an individual, I can't do A, B, C, D to you. If that happens to you, then these are the actions that, that uh, you should take. And again, sometimes people think that when we say community-led, then if there are harmful cultural practices going on, if there's a child being beaten to that, to death, if you meet a child who has been who has been defiled by the roadside and all that, and we just keep quiet, we don't, uh, you know, uh, address the issue because we are community-led. We let the community do whatever they want, but that is not the case. So, just to answer your question, is that part of the process, part of the entry process into the community, is to ensure that the community one is aware of their rights. They know that anyone can abuse a child, including you as a community-led facilitator. And they should know that they have a responsibility to protect their children in a way that even you as a person, if you are the perpetrator, then let them know the actions to take if that, if that happens. So uh, that is how uh, we have uh, been doing it. And I'm also protecting myself as a community facilitator because there are certain issues in the community that are very sensitive, you know. You have to find a way of engaging the community in discussing them. You have to find a way of respecting everyone. You have to find a way of diplomatically engaging the community so that you don't step on people's shoes. I remember in one of the contexts where we were, the issue of... Uh, it's called disco matanga. So disco matanga means like a funeral disco where someone has died and then there's a disco that plays for several days and it was a hot spot for child abuse and all that. And the section of the community started pushing uh, against it. But there were some sections of the community that were very resistant <laughs> uh, of that. And so you have to make sure that you are not seen as supporting those who are for it, and you are against those who are against it. You know, 
you have to engage these two warring groups in a diplomatic manner so that you also don't put your life uh, at risk. So in a nutshell, it all comes down to, I think as people who are going into the community and working with the community, we have the responsibility of also empowering the community to be able to uh, take action whenever there's an issue. And let us not assume that communities live in isolation. There are systems, government systems, there are some other NGO systems that the communities can plug into to also support them. So it goes back to my point uh, uh, when I was starting off uh, saying that community-led is not about community, do it alone, you are on your own. It's about how do we partner in a way that we all benefit out of this partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, and also this sort of delicate balance of um, when you see things that are harmful to children, but also not wanting to uh, kind of be the person who is going around reporting all of these things, that's going to maybe destroy a lot of confidence and you might make enemies as well. So it's about being di diplomatic and I guess, yeah, helping the community to do it for themselves. Um, but maybe we can hear from Juan Jose. How did you manage safeguarding in the context you were telling us about earlier? Thank you, Lucy. Uh, and thank you, Ken. I thought it was so inspiring. I wish I, I have talked to you before, actually. Um, so when, when we went through, through the process, I, I will say in the first context that we implemented seed, seeds, uh, and I, I need to tell this before just to tell you how, how I addressed it and we addressed it in, uh, in Chocom. Uh, we actually did it in a very formal way and and and, and very straightforward way of, of how our policy or safeguarding policy uh, work with. So we basically trained um, the community coach and we trained the community facilitators, which are community volunteers, uh, in safeguarding in in the community coaching in the in the first uh, community facilitators training that that we did and we made them sign the policy um, and all, all of this. So I'm, I'm just mentioning this to say that this is not the way to go um, because we, we really, yeah, we really worked there, there in a top-down manner and we actually made them sign the policies and, and, and made some asseverations and you need to comply. And this is, uh, yeah, uh, we of course went through the process, but, but it wasn't, I think, uh, the best way to go. So. We then reflected with um, Diego, who is the community coach uh, in that implementation, uh, and also with Greenskian and, and, and with Ridiona, which is our safeguarding um, global advisor on, on this a lot. Uh, and we went uh, with a different uh, approach for, for this implementation in the, in the indigenous communities that I'm telling you about, which looks a little bit more than what Ken mentioned it. Uh, so we basically, when we introduced it to the community and made the decision if they wanted to, to work with us, um, we went through what it, safeguarding really mean, meant uh, through this process so that really meant to keep children safe, even from Diego, which was the community coach, and even from the community facilitators who were part of, of also the community, but which were involved in seats. Um, so basically what we did there is we started, we, we made some agreements uh, with the community. So we uh, did a community meeting. Uh, they, they were the ones who discussed it. Uh, we went through with them uh, of what it meant uh, for, for us, safeguarding what it meant, that it really meant for protecting my, uh, children from us but also from the community facilitators who were part of the SEEDS uh, process. And that this actually was uh, something interesting to think about uh, in the community. And, and that's also what they, what they thought. So we got to a set of agreements, uh, which included um, yeah, behaviors, uh, ways of, of, of doing activities with children, um, ways of doing the SEEDS activities that really will get will will ensure that children are safe and also mechanisms in which they could tell us uh if something or if we or if something was wrong with for example diego who was the community coach of with one of the community facilitators or the community assistant who was an an indigenous um person who was hired by war child as well 
Um, so this is basically what we we did and what we keep doing. We try to go through with them what it, what it means. We ask powerful questions about it. So we ask, what does it mean to keep children safe? We ask, how, what does it mean? Uh, what could we do to children uh, or who could do harm, harm to children in that community? Um, and, and they get to the point that they actually reflect where that we also can can do harm and take advantage of our uh, power position and, and, and we make some agreements, which we also combine uh, and we also agree to with this, with the community. Thanks, Juan Jose. That's really interesting. So um, firstly, thanks for being really honest um, and sort of giving us a little snapshot of what not to do <laughs> at the beginning, which was um, to sort of think, oh, we must have a top-down safeguarding um, set up whereby people sign official documents about that where they commit not to do certain things and to abide by rules and that you sort of uh, realized that that wasn't work, wasn't really the right way and that you went over to this more community led one. And it's interesting that both of you said, you know, the, the role of, I guess, if you call yourself the NGO stroke facilitators was to, you know, raise awareness to a certain extent of the fact that safeguarding is an important thing. And these are the things, this is what it's like. These are the consequences. Um, so that it was kind of giving information so that communities could decide how they would sort of handle it. And also, I guess, being there um, in the cases where there was something really serious that the community wanted to get some help with. So like Ken said, it's also not community led doesn't mean the community is alone. Um, there is a role that is played by uh, NGOs and other agencies working with communities. Um, so that's really helpful. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask, Ken, um, somebody, um, we had a discussion in our WhatsApp group um, over the last few weeks about, I think it's about you, you as an NGO worker and your level of visibility in a community and how does that affect, um, how does that affect um, sort of working in a community led way? And I gave an example of a group of people in Mozambique, practitioners that I was working with in November, who after we went through this um, kind of community-led uh, training, they started to wonder if they should be wearing their official vests that identify them as NGO workers in the community, or they were thinking maybe we should just wear like everyday clothes and be more invisible. So Ken, I wanted to ask you, what's your view on um, the sort of visibility of an NGO worker or staff or practitioners um, putting NG and in, that includes putting NGO logos around the place. I think we're all very familiar with what it looks like when an NGO works in a community. Um, how, how do you see that in relation to a community led approach? Thank you, Lucy. These are very controversial <laughs> topic. <laughs> yeah. So my sense is that I think as NGOs, myself being included, I think we've borrowed a lot of our operations from the corporate world. And so <laughs> the issues of visibility, branding uh, are very important uh, to us. And they are very important because we want to take uh, we want to take, uh, how do we call it? We want people to know that we are the ones who do, did this or we are the ones who, uh, who are doing We want to take credibility for changes in the community. And most importantly, we're also doing it for uh, our donors who want to see uh, results. My sense is that... Uh, one, the issue, the issue we are battling with in most contexts right now, uh, the issues of expectations, the issues of dependence, uh, some part of that emanates from just presentation and branding, not even the project itself and what we do in the community. 
because I can imagine going into the community where I work in, and I'm in a Land Cruiser, branded blah, 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 NGO, with all the T-shirts and all that. Already that in itself shows money, it speaks money in those contexts. And with money, then there's, there's, there's demand and there's expectations and people presenting you with both real, imagined, and, and, and uh, fake problems, lies, so that they can get something out of you. My, my, my take, just my personal take <laughs> on this topic is that I think dealing with human beings is different. I think the business that we do as NGOs, even though we want uh, issues of attribution, even though we want to show that we have changed lives and, and all that. Uh, but we understand that then we are not selling Coca-Cola. We are not uh, selling furniture. That our work is to support people at the community level to improve their well-being to improve their attitudes, their changes, their behaviors. There are things that can be measured, there are things that can't be measured. And uh, if you do, if you design your meal very well, if you invest in your meal very well, you can still draw attribution without, uh, uh, without the brand. But branding for me, is one of the problems we are dealing with in terms of uh, expectation. And I, I understand, I understand how the, <laughs> the, the system works and why it is important for organizations to have to place their logos, their t-shirts and, and all that. But I think it is just time to, to understand that the things we are de dealing with are different from uh, from the the corporate world. If we are really adding value to the community, then we have to understand that having a the branded T-shirt or a logo in the community does not add any value to uh, to the community. But I also understand sometimes, you know, issues of security issues. It, it's so complex, but there are ways of of going about it. Uh, and I think uh, because of time limitation here, we can't go in, in, into that. But I, I just feel that, you know, branding comes with uh, you know, with, with certain kind of expectations that is then difficult to kill in the long run or to get rid of uh, in, the, in, the, in the long run. And yeah. so, yeah. I just, don't, I just don't want to say let's do it this way because contexts are very com complicated, <laughs> you know. Contexts are very different. But yeah, that's so right, if, yeah. Yeah. The more we try to do community work, as opposed to corporate work in the community, the more we are going to have a positive impact uh, in the community. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, I mean, um, the WhatsApp group, it was interesting because people are obviously from a very different context. There was a lot of people from the Middle East. And, and in some cases, they were like, no, it's very important because you need to be identified um, as an NGO worker or a humanitarian worker so that you won't be targeted by violence in certain ways. Um, but you told me a really interesting story once um, when we were talking one time a couple of years ago and you said, oh, it's, it's really interesting because um, people don't see me as like a member of any, any kind of organization or that there's a project. They just see me like another community member now. And if if I'm away from the community for a while, somebody inevitably will call me from the community and say, hey, Ken, where have you gone? We haven't seen you for ages. Where are you? Um, but, but not really because he's part of a project, but they now see you as this member of a community. And that is a very different um, 
way of being in a community and working in a community than what perhaps we're mostly used to, which is more, I think, where this question comes from around the visibility of, you know, NGO logos and you wearing your T-shirt and your vest saying um, where you're from. So, but like you say, it's it's very much about context, but I guess it's good to be aware that when you come with logos and T-shirts and big cars, you bring, you create potentially expectations that are very hard to uh, downplay and might influence how communities act when you're working with them. Um, I think maybe well, let's, I'm um, seeing the time is going fast. So why don't we just move on? I think um, there was another question for, that Juan Jose was uh, looking forward to answering. And it was, I want to ask you this one, um, Juan Jose. It says, the question was, or is, when partners were asked to lead the design of a project or a program, how did they respond? Was it easy for them to take the lead naturally? Uh, and did they feel enough support and guidance was available? So I guess the summary of that question is, you know, what, how do you get going um, with communities and get them on board um, around this kind of approach? Um, and I think actually it's a little bit related to to the to the previous question around around the best and the visibility, because uh, I think it all adds up to to how we how the relationships arrangements are established and and the power relationships that um, us coming from an I, I NGO or us looking different from that community um, set up from the beginning. Um, so what I what I really want to to emphasize here is that uh, we really need to address those power relationships and and we really need to get into those discussions, uh, and it is not just one time that we will discuss it and and it will be solved, um, because for example in in, in Colombia, um, yeah we we really need to to make ourselves the question around privilege and why we know some things or, or why we have been educated in some things. Uh, and why other people haven't or, or haven't had the access to. Uh, so when we when we went in, and I, and I will go back to my first experience in Bogota, um, there are really, really um, very strong indicative ways of, of how the, the relationship or arrangement or, or the institutional arrangement of that relationship between us and the community is establishing. Uh, and we really, really need to take it, keep in mind and, and of the community ownership principles that are embedded into a community-led approach. Uh, we really need to keep reflecting ourselves about our privilege, our identity, uh, why we think we know how to solve the issues of, of, of our community and, 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 and really get rid of that. And, and there's not really a, a specific formula to get rid of that, uh, but we really need to reflect together with the community uh, on that. Uh, so there's a mind shift that is key, uh, and, and this is from us, uh, not from the, the, the community. The community um, can really empower themselves, but, but it's us that really need to reflect our, on ourselves and, and, and get that reflection on privilege on, and on, on power relationships. Um, I think using a facilitation approach is a key part of this. Um, so, for example, when we were into discussions uh, for develop, uh, delivering or, or developing the action, the action plan uh, in, in a community in Bogota. Uh, there was one facilitator who is a, a, a very nice woman, um, which we have worked with in the past. Uh, and she was mentioning, okay, but the, um, you should tell me because you're the one who knows. Um, and, and, and of course there's a, yeah, when, when you see, for example, that he's taking three community meetings to get into a, a development of our action plan, there's a temptation to go like, yeah, we can do this. Uh, but really, at, at that moment, what is important is to keep that facilitation approach, keep that, um, yeah, keep really thinking on, 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 on the community-led approach and ask the questions that you need to, to ask to these persons. So it's not um, not saying like, no, you're the one that should, that should do it because this is just like throwing the ball. Uh, but it's really getting into questions that make them reflect like, yeah, but this person really don't know the community. Uh, he has been here for some time, has been working, uh, but maybe, yeah, we're the ones that, 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 that have gone through this learning process. We're the ones that really can get to an answer. Um, 
So that was that was also very very interesting and self reflective for me when I got that directly uh, in 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 a community, and that was the process that I I, I was um, accompanying uh, more uh, frequently. So I was going to all 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 the meetings and all the all the phases in that one. Um, I I really think that uh, it is it is not us to empower the community. I really think that they. Uh, that it's us uh, facilitating reflection uh, with them, together with them, uh, on, and they are the ones who will get to the reflection that they are the ones that can do it and that know uh, what the community needs and know how to address it. Of course, we can provide tools. Of course, we can uh, also um, provide support uh, through the process and we can get into deep talks and deep reflections. And this is also very important because it's not just as Ken said, community-led doesn't mean um, just leaving the community to do whatever and you take credit for that, and it's not really that. Uh, but you, you you really need to use the privilege that you have. So you have been trained in community coaching. You have been trained probably if you're implementing this in, in what community ownership means. Um, so you really need to get into those discussions and, and really uh, let the community empower themselves uh, through, through those reflections. It's really interesting to hear from you on that. And, you know, yeah, you're right. The, the, the question that Ken answered previously sort of links to that. And I think a lot of times when practitioners are asked to work in a community-led way, there's so many expectations and sort of almost dependencies that have been created by previous interventions by perhaps your own NGO or, or other agencies, um, that it's quite difficult sometimes to um, kind of get going in this new way uh, because there's a lot of expectations and suddenly we're doing things differently and people haven't necessarily experienced um, anything like it before. Whereas when you compare it to, say, uh, what happened in where Ken was working in Marafa, you know, people saw the good impact of the work. And so other villages took up, wanted to copy it. Um, there wasn't any convincing required. So I guess if you're pioneering these kind of approaches in areas where thing, this type of community-led approach has not been used before, it must be quite challenging. I was wondering if, uh, seeing as we've got about another 15 minutes, um, Mariana, did any questions come through that, we could ask our guests um i have a kind of linked question that just popped up into my mind so we'll just take the opportunity to, to just go for it um for Jose, you you were mentioning about that we need to reflect on our own privilege and why is it that you know that we go into a community and we think that we can help a community solve solve their problems so something that popped up into my mind as you said that was that often if we're thinking about humanitarian settings um, we we may think that we, as humanitarians, have the experience of how to respond in a certain faster way. We have more information about specific type of child protection risks that might be expected in a humanitarian uh, setting. And, you know, so that we may have this humanitarian experience from a different context that maybe this community doesn't have yet. Um, but I would be really curious to hear your reflections or maybe, maybe both of your reflections, Juan Jose and Ken, on... Um, how applicable are community-led approaches in kind of acute humanitarian settings where we feel we may need to act faster um, than what we often may, may be doing in a kind of community-led way? So that's the question to Ken, right? Did you ask Ken specifically? or um, I was asking, yeah, e either either one, I guess, that, that feels that they would like to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, just to say it's a good question and it's one that comes up all the time. Um, you know, can you use this community-led type approach in, in the humanitarian setting? And by that, we don't just mean the protracted ones where people perhaps find themselves in camps for a long time, but something that happens you know, uh, an acute disaster, for example, um, an earthquake or some conflict that, that happens very quickly. Can you use an approach like this? So, Lucy, you can attest that we have discussed about the same topic, I think, in more than four or five forums. So, again, what we are saying is that we are not saying top-down is bad. 
and we should completely get out of it, get rid of it and throw it out of the window. And we are not saying community-led is the only way to go. We understand that different contexts, different situations, different circumstances will need different kind of approaches. And so there are some humanitarian contexts that leaves you with no option but to do the top-down approach because it's a matter of life and death. There is no time for discussion. It is time for saving lives, saving children, saving women, saving men. And so in some humanitarian situations, you will just have to go the top-down approach, you know, and save lives. But also in some contexts where maybe it's a refugee camp and people have settled and, uh, you know, like in Kenya, you know, we have uh, two big refugee camps and there are people who have been there for more than 20, 30 years. So that means the approach you used when these people were coming into the camp then would be different when they have finally settled. Maybe you'll have to have a blend of the two. You'll have some top-down and you'll have some community-led. And there are situations that would demand 50-50. You have some top-down and you have some community-led. But all in all, we are saying uh, respect for humanity is key. Respect for people is key. Respecting people's culture is key. Respecting individuals for who they are is key in all those processes. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Um, Juan Jose, have you got any thoughts on this? I, I think I fully I fully agree with, with what Ken said. So it's not to throw out uh, top-down approaches because sometimes they, they can be relevant. Uh, but also just wanted to emphasize that it's not completely impossible to, to think of a community-led approach uh, when working on humanitarian settings. Uh, there's ways that, uh, of course, participation can be incre increased in the decisions of, of what are their needs or what are the needs that need to be addressed by the organization. So I think uh, it's it's not to completely throw it away. And I think, for example, a process like SEEDS, if, if there's a humanitarian crisis, uh, could also work, for example, in a refugee camp or on a displaced people camp. Um, because it's it's just the, the the community reflect really reflecting and, and addressing the needs that they 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 see for children. Of course, these will need to be accompanied, and, and and it's not to throw away other actions, other humanitarian actions which are key, which for example food safety, uh, wash, uh, and all these these components that are really really needed on on humanitarian crisis, and and maybe there's also. Um, previous reports on what it would work, so I think it's not to, to throw it away. And I think it, it takes me back to one pushback that I have got through when I've been doing SIDS training with uh, teams here or in Latin America, and is the, the question around mm, cases of, of children rights violations in, in the community. Uh, and I think this is this is one of the pushbacks that we also also get when we, we are talking about community-led approaches, and, and I just wanted to to point that out, that it is not that we are uh, leaving those things out, and it is also something uh, that that we can we need to address when we are presenting our approach, and and that we can mention to the community that is this is uh, a specific things that we need to respond to as an organization that we that we have a duty uh, of responding, and actually in Colombia by law we have to to respond. So it's also being clear and and addressing those issues uh, in in the community. Thanks. Yeah. Ken, is there some anything before we finish? Is there anything you want to highlight for us, anyone who's listening in? I mean, community-led approaches. If we want to work in this way, what do you want to highlight? One or two key takeaways that we should remember when we leave this uh, this webinar today. Yeah. So for me, I think uh, community-led tends to address and something that Yuan has also highlighted. Uh, the issue of sustainability. And for me, sustainability is not even what I described about reusable sanitary towers. For me, sustainability is the change in mindset, 
the change in all those attitude, the change, it could be even the change in knowledge. It's either deleting whatever uh, beliefs they had in their mind or gaining something from the, the interaction. And so that change for me, first it's individual before it is communal. And so if the process can lead to individuals starting what Juan talked about, self-reflection, then that's already uh, a big change there. And if the community can do self-reflection, can identify an issue and come up with a solution, that's already a plus there. And so my experience is that community-led is very strong on, on uh, ownership and sustainability because they drive it. And I have evidence to that because I have been away from the community for about a year plus. And when I go back, I still see uh, some of the things that the communities started then. Uh, we're still trying to do it. And uh, mark you, these two communities where we are working in have been heavily hit, were heavily hit by COVID, were heavily hit by uh, climate change. So immediately after COVID, we've had a very long period of drought that has greatly affected these communities. And so from a child protection lens in such kind of uh, context, I'm already thinking transactional sex, I'm already thinking GBV, I'm already thinking children being abused, I'm already thinking about so many of those things. But then when I go back, you hear the community talk about how they have even identified some of those issues and they are trying to deal with them, you know. And that gives, gives, uh, you, know, gives you hope, gives you uh, courage. Finally, I would just emphasize that what I said, community-led doesn't mean leave community alone. It just means give the community space, give them the power, let's work together, let's partner, let's link up, and let's have one goal of, you know, protecting our children. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, that's nice to think about um, as we leave. Um, Juan Jose, you've got two minutes to give us a couple of takeaways. What do you want people to remember from this? Sure, three, three key points. Um, well, I think um, there needs to be really a reflection within the country office or um, yeah, or, the, or the program that, that it's working on a, on a community-led approach. Uh, and also starting from senior management, from grant management, uh, because this this is really uh, a different way of working, and 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 you really need to take into account that uh, you have to adapt to to the community base, the community times, and all these kind of things. Uh, I really just just want to emphasize on on the importance of reflective practice again, because uh, I think. Um, yeah, I think there's many times where we will want to interfere because we had a we have a results framework, we have a logical framework, we have a, a project uh, outline, and we need to to address to, uh, uh, and, and respond to it. Uh, but also, it's it's better to to reflect yourself, but also reflect with the also within seats with the community coaches, the community facilitators, uh, and actually better to reflect with the whole community on on those needs uh, too. Uh, and put those on the table will be better than than just influencing it and and doing it uh, your way or, or 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 go back to a top down approach while preaching you're you're doing a, a community led approach. Uh, and also, I just wanted to emphasize that what I've seen in communities is that people really feel validated and 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 they really uh, feel that we. Um, understand and validate their protective and caring role in the community when we work in this way. Um, so they they really, really, really um, feel uh, empowered. And this is not something that we uh, do as an NGO, but that they go through with a process of reflection about child protection risks, uh, prioritization of, of those risks that are relevant, 
um, developing an action plan which involves the community and, and, and reflecting on, the, on that plan. So it's, it's, a, it's a process and I, I feel and what I've seen at the end of, of implementations of SEEDS is that they really, really feel that they are, um, they, they, they think that people now see them as people who care about the children and who do actions uh, to care about the children and to protect children in, in those communities. Just those things. Great. Thanks so much, Juan Jose. So yeah, actually the word that stood out for me from both of what you said around these takeaways was reflection. You use this word a lot of times. So um, I think a big part of community-led work is us reflecting as organizations, us reflecting as child protection practitioners, us facilitating community reflection around um, and helping children reflect. I think reflection is something we don't have a lot of time for in a lot of our typical programs. So maybe um, that's also a good word to remember for those takeaways. So I just want to say a massive thank you to Ken and Juan Jose for giving us their time, for allowing us to understand in more detail um, what community-led child protection can look like. This podcast was made possible thanks to the Child Resilience Alliance with a grant from Oak Foundation. It was produced and hosted by myself, Lucy Hillier, of the Community Child Protection Exchange. Original music was composed and performed by Jay Bones. Thanks and see you next time.